You're listening to Parents You've Got This, the expert guide to parenthood. Your complete guide to pregnancy, birth, baby and parenting. Join us for the journey. Pregnancy is an incredibly exciting time, but it's also a daunting time because it's so many questions and you need to know the answers. Um, and so we're so incredibly lucky that today we'll be chatting with our obstetrician expert, Dr. Peter Jesevic, all about understanding pregnancy and the pregnancy care process. Dr. Peter Jesevic is an obstetrician and gynecologist with more than 27 years of obstetrics experience. He has delivered more than six and a half thousand babies and he works in public and private practice, both at Francis Ferry House and the Royal Women's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pete. You are a leader in your field and we are very lucky to have you. Thank you. So we're gonna jump straight into the questions, Pete, and start at the very beginning of the pregnancy journey. You know, how early can we detect that we're pregnant? Sure. So women are very attuned to their bodies for the most part, and particularly for a woman who's traditionally aware of her regular 28-day cycle, the average, if she's a couple of days late for a menstruation, and particularly if she'd been trying to get pregnant, she'll be very aware of that and very likely gone off to the chemist to get a urinary pregnancy screen. Urinary pregnancy screens nowadays are actually very sensitive. So when you think about it, you might miss your period on day 29, but in actual fact, the conception might have occurred around day 16. So with the cumulative amounts of pregnancy hormone in your system, some of the pregnancy tests can pick that up quite early. So some women are doing their urinary test on, say, day 24, 26, and possibly getting a faint line and realising that they might in fact be pregnant. So that's certainly the earliest that you can detect. What are some common um, early pregnancy symptoms or signs, Pete, that people might feel and think, oh, that feels a bit different? If we talk about the unicorn, there are those women out there who have no symptoms and it's literally just a a missed menstruation, but that is the unicorn. Mm -hmm. Most people are usually going to experience something and that can vary from very minor degrees of nausea, uh, a little bit extra lethargy, uh, breasts become a little bit more swollen or a bit more uncomfortable uh, and that would be sort of the commonplace type of symptoms. Uh, My partner often said her reflux got worse. That was her early sign. Um, So there can be a multitude of symptoms and of course there can be the real extremes where symptoms in particular when we refer to nausea, vomiting and the extreme version of hyperemesis, women can be quite sick and very debilitated from it. So beyond food aversions and not being able to really feel like they can eat and drink, what they do eat and drink comes up very quickly. And, you know, in some situations that can have consequences to not just how you feel, but of course your health and well-being and definitely would speak to your care provider about that. I definitely knew I was pregnant before. When I peed on the stick, it said I wasn't pregnant, but I was vomiting and felt terribly sick. And so I actually knew I was pregnant before the stick did. And then eventually the stick showed that I was pregnant. So I definitely can adhere to the fact that you can discover it before um, you actually confirm it. But what do you do, Pete, once you actually do confirm that you're pregnant? Is there anything that you're supposed to do? Sure. So for those of you who've been anticipating trying to get pregnant, you would have been taking a preconception multivitamin or folate supplement and possibly maybe some extra iodine. Uh, and hopefully have maintained good health and you're ready to go. Uh, Generally speaking, what you're going to do is make a decision about what sort of care you wish to have. Are you looking at hospital-based care? Are you wanting to go public or private? But either way, often you would go and speak to your local care provider, your GP, uh, and it's worth you while doing so. You don't necessarily have to do a blood test to confirm the pregnancy. If you feel pregnant and the urine test said you're pregnant, you're pregnant. If you've missed your period, again. But what you would probably do is get some blood testing done, and there's a series of bloods that are usually recommended, yeah, blood count iron stores thyroid, we check some infection, serology, urine. We do a few of these tests and the, your care provider would generally know about these tests. Uh, for some women, they wish to have an early ultrasound scan to cite the pregnancy, confirm it's okay, that's a choice you have. Uh, a lot of us, particularly myself in private practice, we would do that as part of your first visit if you came to see us. But once you've made the decision to go public or private, your GP would often refer you into the system, whether it be to a public hospital or to a private obstetrician like myself where you would have your care we would normally see you in my private practice around the 8th to the 10th week of the pregnancy. But of course, those women who are going to choose to have a home-based uh, pregnancy care, home-based delivery, and they'll probably reach out either to their GP initially, but perhaps to a, a midwifery care provider or doula. Pete, what are the differences between the public and the private care systems from, from that moment that you're talking about now with the early visits um, right through to when you actually deliver the baby? What's the difference between the two? Sure. I'd like to say the answer is there is no difference, but that's actually not the case. So if I can talk to the more significant differences. So one fundamental obvious one is price and cost. So in the public system, you are cared for uh, as a public patient 
and that's Medicare, and that's ironically your taxpayer dollar, but nonetheless it's free care. Now when I talk about the notion of free care, your appointments, uh, any scans or tests you'll have at the hospital, and then the delivery is all managed as part of that, so you're not paying. A lot of the maternity hospitals in the public system will have some testing that they will outsource where they'll get you to go and do those tests in the community through, for example, a Victoria Melbourne Pathorovich, to name but a few. You may, if you're a low-risk pregnancy, have to get your scans done peripherally through one of the various radiology services. And of course, there may be a cost to that. But in general terms, there's no charge. For private, if you have private insurance, you pay private insurance and so you're choosing to have a birth in a hospital and your private insurance will cover the cost of that hospital-based care and delivery. You'll be seeing an obstetrician and the obstetrician, for example, myself, will be looking after you. As an obstetrician who personally works a lot, so uh, generally speaking it's at least 26, 27 days a month, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on call. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that because I enjoy it and because that's the service I wish to provide. But of course, being that available for your personal care and for any concerns you have and for your delivery, we obviously um, you know, attach a charge to that. But that charge is not just for that care, it's also for what's involved in providing that care. So we have large insurance costs, we have large operating costs and so on, and so we have to obviously offset some of that. So that's one fundamental difference. But the other dare I say, fundamental difference is continuity of care. As a very passionate public care provider and a head of unit at a public hospital, I would love to think that every woman who comes to the public system gets continuous continuity of care by the same midwife, the same practitioner. I can speak confidently across all the public jurisdictions, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You'll have different doctors, different midwives at different appointments, you'll have different sonographers as your scans, and very likely you'll have different midwives across the shifts of the birth you have and different levels of seniority of those midwives and doctors as well at your delivery. If you go private, you get me. Okay. Now, if you go private in another care provider, you may get that doctor or their group that they're in, but you are getting an experienced medical practitioner providing that care. And so I could talk across this answer for a long time, but they're the two fundamental differences. And how long you stay in hospital is different too, isn't it, if you go public or private? Yes, look, uh, again, if I speak to the hospitals that I work at and their, their processes, if you have a uncomplicated normal delivery in the public system, you will literally be going home within 24 hours of that birth. And there are home-based domiciliary supports, but you'll be going home with a newborn baby, which as a new parent and new to breastfeeding and new to parenting can be quite daunting. If you have a normal delivery, uncomplicated, in the private hospital I work at, you have five days of support, me seeing you every day and the midwives across the shift supporting your breastfeeding and your recovery. Um, that's not to say that you can't have supported care in that public-based quick exit approach, but you can argue that it is a bit different. And so in regards to the pregnancy journey, I often hear to it referred to as trimesters. Can you talk to us a little bit about what are the trimesters and how they're broken up? Yeah, so try three. So three trimesters, and generally speaking, although we talk about pregnancy over 40 weeks and you can't divide 40 by three easily, so we simplify it to 13, 26, and then the remaining 14 weeks up to term. So the first trimester is that early phase of pregnancy where we're obviously acutely aware of the early onset of symptoms and managing those, particularly food aversions, nausea, etc. Getting through that early pregnancy testing, we can start doing early genetic screening at that stage, which is of you know, some interest and uh, benefit to patients to know that. Uh, and obviously looking out for, gosh, forbid, you know, sort of concerns with miscarriage and so on. The second trimester for the majority of the population with few pregnancy complicating circumstances is a fairly quiescent phase. You often get your energy back, the nausea is diminished. You're not looking that pregnant early on until maybe around the 20th week when you pop and then from about 20 to 26 weeks you're becoming a bit more pregnant but generally you're managing those symptoms and, and even niggles, aches, pains, nausea, etc. are less common. The third trimester is the physicality of the pregnancy and there's a reality, there is a human being growing in you and that human being's getting big and it's going to be two, then three or so kilos on average. And with that and with the metabolic demands of pregnancy and all the effects of hormones on your body from constipation through to aches and pains and so on, you're going to really feel it and that can be really variable. And this is going beyond the grounds of complicated pregnancies where there are problems. So. We break it up into trimesters and we obviously manage your care and the number of visits 
and the timing of testing as per those trimesters. So Pete, if we're, we're pregnant and we're, you know, maybe in the, at the later stages of the first trimester or in the second trimester, um, you know, I know that I was really excited to first feel my baby move. When can we expect to first feel our baby move and what are the factors that impact when we feel that? Sure. So uh, the buzzword is quickening and that's the, uh, the early onset of the first lot of movements. And we think really the earliest is usually going to be 16 weeks and it can be as late as up to 20 to 22 weeks. Uh, I have had women anecdotally who have noticed movements as early as 14 weeks, little butterflies, etc. Uh, the one fundamental um, thing that really affects movements is, or the perception of early on, is the location of the placenta. So uh, women often don't realise this, but when you conceive, the egg and the sperm actually fuse in the tube. And then the little embryo migrates down the tube into the uterus and, it, and then it sticks somewhere. And where it sticks is where the placenta forms. Now, if that sticks up high or on the back or on the sides, then as a general rule, the front of the uterus is, is, is uncovered. And so you would expect that as the baby starts to get bigger and stronger, you will feel kicks. And so around the 16 week of the pregnancy where a baby's 200 odd, 250 grams in weight, you might start to feel that as butterflies. But if you've got an anterior placenta where your baby's placenta is stuck, it's like a big cushion. And so that baby might have to get to four to 500 grams, 20, 22 weeks before those kicks are strong enough to kick through the placenta and you'll feel it. So women do get a bit anxious sometimes because pregnancy symptoms have diminished. They're feeling a bit better in themselves. They're feeling a bit more normal. They haven't got a bulge yet. And yet, how do I know everything's okay? And I'm now 17 weeks and I still haven't felt the movements yet. And so some women get a bit worried about that. If you are worried, whilst I would reassure you, it's very easy to do a quick little check of the fetal heart or an ultrasound scan if you need that for peace of mind. What about, Pete, if you've felt the baby move before and then you have a period where you don't feel your baby move? When should you be worried? Look, arguably you could say immediately, uh, but then again, you have to give it context into the stage in the pregnancy because in that sort of late sort of first trimester, or well, first trimester, second, early second trimester into that sort of advancing phase of that second trimester, it would be normal for sometimes to have a change in the perception of movements. Uh, and, and arguably so, because a lot of the time what we explain to women is fetal movements aren't precise. Your baby's nervous system is maturing, but it's erratic. And so the, a lot of the movements are just non-consequential movements. They're just kicking all over the place. But your baby's growing metabolically at a rapid rate. And so it might flip its, ba its back around. So it's gone from, you don't have an anterior placenta, the back's here, the placenta's on the back, it's kicking backwards onto the placenta, you're not feeling it. And all of a sudden it's had a really big metabolic run of growth slowing down a little bit so it's very likely going to be fine and in fact we argue that 98 percent of babies when they go quiet on you are going to actually be fine but because two percent of babies sometimes aren't fine we worry not just about the two percent we worry about the whole lot so when a baby's quiet particularly at advancing stages in the pregnancy where we're a bit more attuned to knowing that that could biophysically indicate a problem with the baby we encourage you to a little bit of a poke and a prod try to wake the baby up something cold to drink or something sweet, a stimulant to sort of wake the baby up. But if a period of time goes past and the baby remains quiet and that's to your perception of what you think is quiet, you notify the birth suite or the care provider and we would normally invite you in to get a monitor, knowing that most of the time it's going to be okay and remembering that a lot of the time any baby that has a concern, we probably already knew about it. You know, it's very rare for babies to have a problem that we didn't already know about. And so what happens in regards to your antenatal appointments, Pete? Can you talk us through what we'd expect if we went in the public, or sorry, in the private system? Yeah, so if we speak to the private system, and this is, I would assume, fairly consistent, uh, we would invite you to come in for your first visit at eight to 10 weeks. If you haven't had any antenatal screening bloods, we'd arrange those for you. Uh, we'd always do an ultrasound scan, at least I would, just to cite the pregnancy, discuss your genetic screening, and then obviously I would generally prognosticating your pregnancy, am I worried or not? After that, normally care can be simplified to six weekly checks early on. So for example, if you came in at eight to 10 weeks, it might not be to 14 or 16 weeks to the next visit, from 16 weeks to 22, and then maybe from 22 to about 26, 28. Now, a lot of you might think, wow, that's a big gap between visits, but often there's a lot happening between the visits. You'll have blood tests at 10 weeks. There'll be a scan at 13 weeks. There's a scan at 20 weeks. There's a glucose test at 26. Uh, there are things happening beyond the visits so that you're not necessarily out of sight, out of mind. 
Generally speaking, in the third trimester, we often invite you to come in for slightly more frequent visits. And the reason is at that stage in the pregnancy, we're more attuned to concerns with blood pressure, which can affect a percentage of pregnancies. We're very attuned to ensuring the baby's growing properly, to assess fetal well-being, to ensure that everything's okay. You'll have a multitude of increasing symptoms and questions that might need answering about those. Uh, we increase the visitation. So for example, maybe every three weeks. In the last couple of weeks of the pregnancy, say from 36 to 40, depending on the pregnancy and how it's going, it might be every two weeks or every week. And usually, certainly myself, I'd be talking you through the countdown symptoms. So if you were to go into labor, if your waters were to break, if something was to suggest that you might need to come in because you're about to have a baby, sort of counseling you on all that. And along the whole way, amongst other things, not just making sure you and the baby are safe, but also discussing your birth, your birth plan, what you're wanting to achieve out of it, guiding you in terms of preparation and so on. So Pete, how does that differ then if we're in the public um, system? What sort of appointments could we expect to have in the public system and who would they be with? So generally speaking, I'd be confident that that uh, specific time frame of appointment should be very almost near identical. Uh, and again, specific to the pregnancy, high risk versus low risk. So I'd be fairly confident there shouldn't be any difference there. Uh, with respect to who you see, it often is based on how you are triaged high risk or low risk. So a low risk pregnancy, we'd be expecting most of your appointments to be with the midwifery team. And for a high risk pregnancy, there'd be more often than not more visits, if not all the visits with a doctor, whether it be with a senior consultant like myself or the senior training doctors, whom all are competent enough to be able to manage you even if they are in the training program. And so is there anything that we should be doing at home? Should we be buying one of those Dopplers to like listen to the baby's heartbeat? I would never say don't buy it, but I, never actually go to my way to recommend it, okay? So if you are at home and you have a Doppler and you can't find the heartbeat, more often than not it's because you haven't used it properly, but what will happen is you will panic beyond panic, okay? Uh, a fairly confident argument can be made that a baby that is moving is a well baby, okay? And you don't need to listen to the heartbeat. You'll also have to be able to understand if you hear a heartbeat, does that constitute normality? Because all the heartbeat really ultimately tells you is the baby is alive. Now, if you don't understand anything about the rate of heart rate, if you don't understand anything about other aspects of biophysicality, you could get a false sense of reassurance anyway. So I'm not saying don't buy one, but I've never gone out of my way to advocate for getting one. Um, Pete, when we, I remember when I went in for my um, antenatal checks that there would always be the fundal height that was checked. Can you talk to us about that? I, I know I used to be really pleased with myself if it had, you know, grown a lot yeah. um, but what are you actually looking for there and what sure. does that what does that mean when you get that appointment I, I think it's ironic in contemporary medicine 2023 that I use a seamstress tape measure to measure the top of the uterus the fundus to the pubic bone so what we call the symphysiofundal measurement to assess how your baby's going but what is terrific is there's good statistical data that if you measure in centimeters per weeks then usually it's a good sign of normalcy of growth so if you're 28 weeks and you're 28 centimetres, plus or minus two centimetres, there's confidence that the baby is growing normally, okay? So normal for gestation. Generally speaking, once you get, beyond, say, three centimetres beyond in predicted measurements, and that's assuming you've measured well because you need to measure well, and you're factoring in, dare I say, a woman's body type. So if a woman's carrying a high BMI, et cetera, uh, that can obviously always influence the situation. If it was twins, etc., and other mitigating problems in the pregnancy. But with, in general, if it was a three centimetre or greater fundal difference, whether it be too big, suggesting maybe the baby's bigger than expected, macrosomic, uh, or small, and you're concerned about growth, it will then alert me to saying, okay, we might need to add additional testing in, and dare I say, an ultrasound scan to assess the baby's growth, the biometrics, biophysicality. And so Pete, I see in your resume, you're a high risk obstetrician. What makes a high risk pregnancy? So there are some women who will have pre-existing conditions or a pre-existing adverse pregnancy outcome and will be very attuned to the potential risks for that coming pregnancy. There are other women who can begin a pregnancy, dare I say, very low risk and you would have no concerns. And then we start to look at some of the things that can happen. So we know, for example, that 7% of women can get hypertension in pregnancy. We know of that cohort of women that a percentage of them can get quite severe preeclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy. So whilst the overall numbers will be low for quite severe disease, at its severest level, severe preeclampsia can cause total body derangement and we can incur 
include liver failure, renal failure, fitting, fetal death, etc. Women can die from this, and certainly in third world countries, that's the case. You can be going along and having a very uncomplicated pregnancy, and then out of the blue, with no risk factors, your waters break prematurely, and then you're all of a sudden you have a problem. You didn't think you were going to get gestational diabetes until you become one of the up to 20% of women that get diabetes nowadays in contemporary care, and then you need insulin, and that changes things. You might be cruising along and everything's going well, and then your symphysiofundal measurement is small, and we do a scan, and then unexpectedly your baby's quite growth restricted, and we think this is going beyond simply just having a small baby. We think the placenta's failing. So... When we come across pregnancies of this nature, this is where we use our medical training to go beyond the simplicity of just routine care and answering questions and concerns you have to very, very close and guarded monitoring to make decisions about how to keep you safe, how to keep the baby safe, when to deliver you, how to deliver you. And obviously we're trying to prioritise the two of you equally to make sure we get the safest and best outcome. Pete, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It is just such a treat as always to have your wisdom and sharing it so generously with our audience. We're very grateful. My pleasure. Thank you also to Ms. Stella for sponsoring this episode. You've been listening to the Expert Guide to Parenthood. Um, next week on the podcast, we're talking about common pregnancy tests and scans again with Dr. Peter Jesevic. And never forget, parents, you've, you've got, got this. this. You've been listening to Parents You've Got This, the expert guide to parenthood. You've got this parenting gig. 